thinking and seeing the world from a chicken's perspective. Probably not something you do every day, but actually a fundamental piece of the regenerative food systems puzzle. Sounds weird? Get ready for a wide-ranging interview on why chickens are such a perfect entry point into the regenerative production world, but also on a regenerative mindset shift and decolonization of our food system. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another interview today with the CEO of Tree Range Farms, which focuses on establishing or maintaining a jungle-like habitat that honors the true natural environment of chickens. When they do this, they not only create a better habitat for chickens, they create a better world. Full disclosure, we invested a small amount through our syndicate in Tree Range Farms. Welcome, Reginaldo. Thank you. I've it's been great looking forward be, to being here with you to this one for a long time. We've we've met before, we've <laughs> exchanged emails, uh, I think a lot of LinkedIn messages as well. And now finally we're here together. Uh, I mean, together, virtually together, unfortunately, this is not in person, it will happen at some point. Uh, but the next best thing is definitely here. And I would like to unpack, of course, your journey. And I have the feeling this conversation goes, will go in all kinds of directions. So let's start with how did you end up, uh, let's say reinventing the, the chicken uh, the chicken farm almost, or tree range farm. Like how did you end up in the, like focusing on soil so much? Well, first of all, thanks for, for this opportunity uh, and also for doing this from across the world for the partnerships. And, and it actually has to do with the answer. Uh, I am thankful for my ancestors, for the wisdom that they actually, that I inherited from them. I did not reinvent anything. I did not reinvent the poultry. I simply it's reinterpreted ancestral teachings and knowledge and ways of seeing and living within the ecosystems that we are part of, not with. No, no, not we don't work with those ecosystems. We are part of those ecosystems. We are nature ourselves. And so when you think that way, when you are taught to live that way, to learn and to share the, the space you live on with all those other organisms, then the only way you would work with livestock, with any animals, with all those creatures, so that you can have sustenance, nutrition, food, as we call it, is by looking at the world from their perspective. It's what we call the indigenous intellect, the indigenous ways, which others who have discovered, quote unquote, discovered this space lately have named regenerative. But it is an ancestral way. I simply utilized that ancestral way of, of being in when I came into this space here in the United States. And I, I mean, my life has been dedicated to agriculture and to, and to finding food and food security and moving out of poverty and hunger in Guatemala. And that process leads you into doing things the way we are here at Tree Ranch Farms and the whole ecosystem on which Tree Ranch Farms is nestled within. Um, you know, and then using that again framework as a way to define how would you do in this case poultry but it isn't just about poultry it's a it's a it's a blueprint for for developing living systems and within that 
all we did was I did and and, and with others was literally ask the chicken, what does it want? And then engineer from that perspective so that we would have the best expression of that living system, um, you know, that creature, their best expression would, would, would emerge out of that design. And that design is based on its ancestral habitat, the jungles of Southeast Asia where it evolved and we simply recodifying that ancestral uh, knowledge into a modern version where the chicken can be raised anywhere in the world where a jungle-like habitat can be replicated. And the rest of it is just the chicken telling us what it needs. And why the chicken? Why did you decide to ask the chicken and, and not another animal or uh, another tree. I mean, there, of course, we will talk about the trees as part of the system. Um, but why is, let's say, the entry point or the starting point, the poultry and the chicken? Yeah, it, it truly spoke to us. Um, so he, here's the process. When you think of of the biophysics and the chemistry of the planet, which is is responsible for all of the energy that is continuously being transformed, from the process of photosynthesis to the animals eating the outputs from photosynthesis, turning them molecularly, breaking them down so that microorganisms in the soil then can then further process that energy. As that energy is continuously processed on the land-based uh, living systems, those three areas on the planetary you know, um, energy transformation infrastructure are, are generating life all the way across the the, 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 the the chain reaction, right? So when you think of those three levels as a foundational competitive adva advantage that we have in order to solve the planetary issues with carbon and, you know, in the air and food and economies and all of that, you have to realize that the, the animal part of the three stages of energy transformation where most of the energy is transformed, the animal part, the livestock, that's where the most efficient uh, transformation of energy is happening. Even a tree that is photosynthesizing, a large landscape photosynthesizing, takes a long time. The animal comes in in a very short time, within 72 plus hours, it will take that photosynthetic output, chew it down, and turn it into meat, hair, manure, and pea and move it within another 48 hours so speed into is the, the crucial piece. massive Exactly. And so livestock was the entry point for us. Now, what us, what, what does it mean us? Well, here's the thing. I'm an immigrant, first generation immigrant in the US. If I were in Guatemala, I would likely have picked turkey and pigs because I have access to forests there that I didn't have access to here. Now, Within the context of the U.S., if you look at the socioeconomic and ecological frameworks under which the dominant systems operate, there is no entry point for anybody who comes in with no land, no financing, no infrastructure, not even knowing the language, not even having connections, doesn't know the history, doesn't have neighborhoods, doesn't, I mean, literally, we are like a duck that knows perfectly well how to swim and all of that, but you drop a dock in the middle of the ocean and we'll know what to do. Even though water is right there, right? Well, I came into this space and the land was there. I understood these things. I needed to learn how these waves in this specific space operated, but the biophysics and chemistry of the planet are the same. So as you go into that process of trying to figure out a strategic way to enter the food and ag system, but don't want to do it from the extractive, exploitative, destructive ways of the conventional ways, but you want to continue to codify that ancestral indigenous ways um, into this new space, you got to find an entry point. Now, livestock, like again, is the entry point. Now, which livestock is the question? And the, and the chicken is the only one that, that spoke to us, shortest livestock life cycle. Yes, one of the most difficult, aggressive, cutthroat sectors of the whole system. But for some of us, especially like in my case, I came from a 
you know, I was four years old when the war started in Guatemala, the civil war, and I was, I had been here in the U.S. four years before it ended. I mean, difficulty and challenges wasn't something that ever said to me, Scared yeah, you, you shouldn't yeah. do that because it's hard. And so, so yes, I, I looked at the whole poultry industry and I knew it was going to be an uphill. There was, there's a very low margin <clears throat> and, and a lot of other barriers in the market. But a beautiful entry point for literally millions, over 30 million workers and small farmers in the U.S. who provide the labor, you know, literally, they, they are the, res- the, the reason there is cheap food and yet go home poor and hungry. So I thought of the chicken not as a livestock but as an as a system level, a strategic entry point that would allow us to have one entry level and a massive ripple impact, and so the the, the chicken became the the main thing for us to codify and then design around. And now, this many years later, we have a whole ecosystem of enterprises, landscape based agronomics, and. You know, we can go on and on about everything we have built on that original idea. But the chicken, the chicken being a jungle fowl allows us to tap and optimize all of the three levels, photosynthesis, animals and soil, and also aligns economically and culturally with all of us immigrants and small farmers in this country and the 700 million farmers across the world that cannot, that can reorganize themselves you know, w- w- with poultry centered thinking, with you know, uh, it can reorganize their farm operations. Um, we know that uh, over over seventy percent of the food in the world, according to the UN, is produced by around seven hundred million plus small farmers with under twenty five acres of of land. And the chicken is the one that can allow us to organize globally a truly transformational. Uh, regenerative and also economically, ecologically, and socially high impact uh, new system, and then create a blueprint for how you could do anything you want in this world. Like seriously, if we can win at that level with one thing like this, being one of the most challenging sectors, I think everything else is downhill. The sky That's is the why limit. the chicken. And so you pick the chicken and then you literally sit down and, and think and ask the chicken, okay, what would an ideal system look like? And it looks very different from your average chicken farm. Um, looks like not even, the, not even on the same planet. So when you ask and when you use your indigenous blueprints you have, like what, what comes out of that? Like how does the process like that go when you really want to look from, in this case, the animal's perspective? How, how, how does that go? How, how does one go about that? So there is a, a process we call indigenization of the mind and then decolonization of methodology and systems, right? So the indiges, indigenization of the mind comes from observation, meditation, sharing of the stories, listening to feedback, and then doing it all over again. And every time asking the question, what does the chicken see? The, the, you can answer that by observing the chickens. You, we can't look at the world from the perspective of the chicken because we are not chickens. I mean, not most of us don't chicken out that easily. But uh, <laughs> but we don't know the, how many chickens uh, are listening line. to this. Yeah, there might be a few. <laughs> I know somebody's yeah. listening to this. Shout out to Anna um, if you're listening to this while packing eggs. So that that comes pretty close to pasture rate, obviously. <laughs> um, but so your that process. Yeah, walk us through that. How how in this case did that go for um for the humble chicken that we we pushed in a whole different direction, let's say with uh, with our industrial extractive ag system, and you're really envisioning another one. Like how how do you go about it? And then of course we'll talk about what it is now, etc. But I'm I'm curious about the process. Yes. So again, you know that. We are born with a innate intelligence that allows us to actually see the world pretty much the way every other creature in the in the planet does, bare, naked, seriously for what it is, not for what we want to turn it into. And I was lucky to be born in extreme poverty, which forced us 
to see everything as it was because there was no other option in order to survive, right? That innate intelligence that all of us are born with, if you then add the observation, meditation, sharing, and all of that, and in this case, the, the exactly the process with the chicken was very simple. I was, I mean, I was born in Guatemala, so I, I, I was lucky to observe chickens my whole childhood, and I already knew quite a lot about their behavior and finding their nests in the wild, all things like that. In Minnesota, it was about, you know, envisioning and, and talking, seeing the world not only from, from the from the chicken, but from all of its relatives, what the Native Americans in Lakota called Tioshpeyes, their families. And so no, no species except for one or two, I think, on the planet, live alone. And so who's who's along the, the the chicken? The chicken, all of us are organisms that are threatened by both ground and aerial, for the most part, um, ground-based threats, right? So the chick as well. <clears throat> so if you think of it, it needs protection at night. It needs protection from the air during the day. I mean, here again, I'm talking to you from the perspective of the chicken. Right. So this is what it takes, being able to see the world from the vulnerabilities of the species you are working with and from the needs of the species you are working with. It needs food. It's going to have to have it from the ground. It doesn't have a chewing mechanism, so it can't rip. It's got to peck and on and on and on it goes. And once you catalog all of that, then you observe the chickens doing exactly what they do. And that's what I did for two years. I just literally sat frequently observe the ranging distance from their barns. Notice that when you move the shelters, they get lost, disoriented, and then and then they get stress, which then affects the immune system. It's it's like a chain reaction, right? So okay, never move the shelter. That was like the first decision we made. Okay, so if you're not gonna move the shelter, then what's the density of of animals that you're gonna have there that balances out with the nitrogen uptake, especially of which species. And then you start talking to the native species. And the hazelnut is the first one that spoke to us from here in the Midwest. And the elderberry was next, and then the oaks, and then the maples, and then the hickory nuts. And then there are all the other species that want to protect the chicken because they need their nitrogen to grow healthy. And so now you start balancing out the nitrogen output, the behavior of the chicken with the needs of of those other species and the needs of the chicken to be protected at night, solid, and protected during the day with chickens. I'm telling you the, the, the code for regenerative thinking right now. That's that's exactly how you do it. And so that's amazing on paper, but then where you start where do you start in practice? Like how do you take that to um to a working system that also functions in the current um very flawed but still the current economic system? Right. So every everywhere you go, whether it's corn, soybeans, sugarcane, uh, and the tropics, is measured according to units of production. Right. So whether it's a cow with a specific um, blueprint, uh, uh, land-based blueprint, or corn and soybeans and so on. I mean, the U.S. is the acre. The acre is your unit of production, right? So everything is measured against that inputs, outputs, government subsidies, corporate welfare, all of that is measured on the basis of acres that you engage with all of those different crops. So we needed to get to that as a first step with this new system. Now, for us, the unit of production wasn't an arbitrary uh, number. It was the blueprint of the of a flock. So you take we took the flocks from 500 chickens to 1,000, 1,500, to 2,000 and even a, a couple hundred to like a 2,200 and, 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 and observe them. And that gave us the balance of where the, the social behavior, the density, the intensity, the grazing, the, uh, especially the ranging ability. The, the egg layer, for example, is got a completely different blueprint than the broiler. And so we separated them early on to observe them in separate environments. And at the beginning, for example, we had the, I had the sheltered, but no fences, no perimeter fences. And I just used flags every day based on the density of ranging. And how then, far they would walk, you basically. know, yeah, exactly how far, how far they, they would, would range. 
Exactly. And then we established, okay, it was about 200 to 220 feet from the shelter. At that point, they were having very little impact. And then we started, we had to like mow and manage the weeds at that point because they weren't eating all of them. There was always like a five, 10% of the chickens that would go that far and would probably have kept going, but that didn't make economic sense anymore because now you didn't have the intensity that we needed in order to start codifying the economics of the production unit. When it was all said and done for broilers here in the Midwest, especially in the upper Midwest, where, you know, we get an average of 30 to 38, 40 inches of rain. We have X and Y species. I mean, that blueprint then became one and a half acres per production unit, 1,500 broilers per flock, three times a year because we get winter and it gets too cold. Uh, one, one building with no more than one square foot per chicken because they don't sleep in, I mean, they only sleep inside. They don't live in the building. So it's the, the square footage is almost irrelevant. It's just the, what is relevant for the building is the sheltering and protective characteristics, not the square footage. Square footage is critical only to a certain point. So they, cause chicken naturally like to go next to each other anyway. So they're not going to spread, like use the space. They Most of our barns are actually empty most of the time because they will pile up against each other and just use the corner. So all of that square footage codification that we saw the industrial system doing is like, sure, if you're going to pack chickens into a factory-like conditions or you're going to keep them inside the shelter, yes, you got to do that because you are not raising them according to the natural instincts. For us, that was not that relevant. Now, how the building is built, that was critical because it represents the shelter, protection from ground predators and so on, right? And that's how we codify this. And that's what became the production unit, one and a half acres. We started with four paddocks. We rotated them with four, and then we moved to three, but that was too difficult. It was too much labor, too complicated uh, because we also had too many fences and we didn't want to use mobile fences because they are, they, anyway, they didn't work. We needed them fixed. And so we needed too many gates and too many potential mistakes. And so we moved to three. And then we realized that we only needed two because they really are light animals. They're not like cows or pigs or sheep. You need you need a different system, like 20 days or plus rotations for sheep and larger for cattle. Well, for chickens, five days, eight days is sufficient. And you rotate them back and forth only about three or four times before they go to the processor anyway. Because even though we grow slow growth breeds, which was another big piece of the process, was what breed to use? What breed responds genetics, better to that kind yeah. of environment? All of it. I mean, I'm telling you, I can only give you the pointers. What went into it was quite extensive observation and management and all of that. When we was when it was all said and done, again, we had one and a half acres divided into two paddocks. One, a building in the center, the shelter with doors going into each paddock so that they will never go out the same door to the same space so that they will never trampling on the same pathway. They were flipping the, so we flip the pathways to get, take care of viruses or, or parasites that, you know, when the animal is not present anymore, then you break their biological uh -uh. cycles, all kinds of things like that. And that became the production unit. One and a half acres, 1,500 chickens per flock, uh, sheltered with at least one square foot per chicken. We now realize that it was, it's too much. We, we can use 0 0.7, 0 0.5 square feet per chicken and it still works. Um, and then, um, the fences, grain, and water. And now you can just dedicate yourself to managing it, throughput, and all of that. And this, by the way, many will say, listening to this, who are trained in this area, say, well, how do you deal with the excess nitrogen that they're going to put out in the field? And the key is that there is no such a thing. One, because the amount of uptake of the perennial crops in the fields is greater than the total nitrogen that the chickens are putting out, even at that density. Most of that is due because they mostly defecate at night and at night they are in the shelters and that manure from the shelter is moved out to fields where there is no chickens. That answers that question because I know it's going to come up. And then for the jungle-like piece, how do, I mean, you said we first looked at, or no, actually you said uh, first the, the hazelnut spoke to us, then the uh, the berries and then some other oak and some others, then how 
did that come into the design of this one and a half acres plus building? Uh, because you need it, you need this perennial species. How did you not picked? I mean, they spoke to you, but how do you design that into a, a system that makes a lot of sense for for you as an operator, but also obviously for uh, for the jungle creature, which is the chicken? Yeah, no, in the past you had a um, a podcast uh, with this fellow Charles Hutchins. Um, it was it, you were the one interviewing them, but they were talking about the um, awakened mind and the achiever mind. Well, now this is about as good as it gets in terms of balancing out those two. The indigenous, I don't call it awakened mind and achiever mind. Just let's cut it what it is: colonizer versus indigenous. That's really what it is. Um, the, the 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 indigenous mind is fully aware of everything going on. The colonizer mind is just trying to get something, achieve something, extract, in other words. And so in this context, what what we were looking for is, as we think uh, about this species, we're looking at the at the fact that we have to get a return on investment. And so but you but you are doing it with a native species, the hazelnut. We look for hybrid hazelnuts that were more productive than the wild versions, right? So a little bit of improvement there on the species as well, on the on the varieties or the cultivars. And then we put them on in rows. Because in rows we can uh, we can expedite the process by which you manage them and you harvest them, right? So that's to the extent that we're using the colonizer mine. But on the other side, we're looking at the symbiotic relationship and the biome on which that species evolved in partnership with other species. So for, to figure that out, I went up north many times with the Minnesota and Iowa Conservation Corps, and I, I went into clear-cut areas in northern Minnesota and burnt areas to watch what were the clusters that came back naturally. And you will find berries, especially raspberries, hazelnuts, elderberries, oaks, and some maples. That's, and then by up there, birch and aspen, right? So, so I watched that and then we came back and to the extent that we could, we started mimicking that association of plants in the paddocks. And that way we could reconcile the fact that we, 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 we were stacking enterprises, timber, biomass, nut production in chickens, plus large-scale grain sprouting systems in the understory and forages. Those were things that we wanted to optimize. And this way, we could we could do that while at the same time achieving some level of mechanical efficiency in the planting, harvesting, and then in the management of the chicken, because the chicken needs to run all the way to the feed and water in the morning. And so the rows allows us to create literally chicken runs. And so, so anyway, you can see now the pattern. That, that's how you go about this. So reconciling the fact that you still need to harvest something in the most economical way, but not going all the way colonizer and overcoming and, 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 and blocking the indigenous intellect that is trying to, to balance out the need to harvest something, right? So this is where we have to start practicing. You asked before, how do we do this? And I said, indigenization and decolonization, right? Well, here's an example of how you still think from an indigenous perspective, but you are applying decolonized methodology because it's only partially about efficiencies of the way we understand from an extractive perspective. It's also about balancing out with the the natural geoevolutionary desire of those species to give us all they can and to give us all they can, they need companions and support. And the chicken and the hazelnut and the elderberry and all of those are how they actually optimize that gift that they have for us. And what has been the biggest challenge in this, or if there was like to when you designed or when you formed, let's say these, these systems, is it feed, is it um, the processing, which we get to, um, or or something else that has been um, the biggest in that balance between the extractive uh, and the regenerative mind, or between the the, um, the indigenous and the non-indigenous? What what has been a compromise or, or the biggest challenge you had to to solve for? Uh, maybe you're still struggling with that. We still are, but I think all of us. I mean, if we were to put a common denominator for this whole space. I think that what 
Will Harris said in another interview that he did with you guys, you know, he, he said that the only way we're going to have a regenerative future is if consumers start to desire and start to support this kind of systems. And then in the same sentence or following that, he says, but they won't, it won't happen, right? Now, there is a lot of stuff like short-term memory and so on, but I think that all of this, all of us face the challenge of culture, the culture of cheap, the culture of fast, the culture of, oh, you are just a farmer, the disregard for the most in, one of the most important citizens in any part of the world, that culture, the, you know, in Guatemala, nobody wanted to say in school that you were campesino because that was like so degrading, right? Because if you are not a campesino anymore, well, you are now better off. You are smarter. You are all these things that a campesino is not. It's dirty, it's stupid, it's dumb, it's all of those things, right? So I think that culture is the biggest barrier all of us encounter right now because that interferes with the way people invest, interferes with the way people choose their food, their nutrition in, in the store. And instead of choosing nutrition, they are choosing poison at a very high price, by the way. Very expensive poison, while here it is very affordable nutrition, right? Yet, why do we pick this? That culture is our biggest challenge by far. And then from there, you, you start seeing how it trickles. So, for example, from a scientific perspective, the fact that we have a scientific community that in the name of feeding the world has generated over 80 plus thousand chemicals, 100% designed to kill, to destroy, right? Instead. And so that culture is also so up, we are so up against it. That when we start talking this way, when we're talking about real science and the real biophysics and chemistry of the planet and how regeneration, regenerative ecosystems actually have their own self-generated inputs. You don't need the agriculture industry to do regenerative agriculture. And that even is though such they, a, even they, they, they are trying pretty hard to, to frame that narrative uh, of that they are uh, definitely part of a regenerative future. It's, it's fascinating, interesting, and scary to see at the same time, but it means it, at it least is. we're getting somewhere. We're it getting, is. we're getting to a, um, I wouldn't say threat level, but at least we're being noticed, which is which is a good thing. Um, but it's yeah, it's fascinating the the killing focus, and so so many rabbit holes here. But have you seen a shift over the last years? If you've been basically deep into the protein space, um, in that piece of culture, like have you seen something change over the last years, or or not? Oh, significantly. So one indicator of how things are changing is that, you know, beef consumption is going down. Now, there is a lot behind it, of course. It's people blaming the cows for their farts and burps and people blaming the the farmers and the industry for the animal abuse and welfare, all of those things, right? But it is changing. The, the consumer choice, it, because, you know, beef consumption has been going down, at least here in the U.S. Pork is barely staying put. It's not growing. It hasn't been growing. Meanwhile, chicken has been on the rise in double digits, right? And so those are trends we are tracking closely. Now, if we can at least move that into that growth space, and instead of the growth being more conventional chicken, we can tap into that growth, because why is there... The changes in the other sectors are happening because consumers are more concerned about their food and about what is it doing to the to the climate, right? But they also need high quality and are willing to pay a better price for something that guarantees them, you know, that peace of mind and better health outcomes. Okay, well, that's part of the growth in that we have watched that change significantly, that, especially like since to the consumer or the 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 customer or whatever we want to call it at the end buying your your chickens has that been uh, quote unquote easy has that been um rel relatively straightforward to get a proper price of course for um for the work you put in so far so good knock on wood as they say uh and it continues it continues to grow now of course once people taste the chicken they know this is good chicken is worth the price anyway. So to get them to that point is hard. 
But we know that because of the feedback, people who have said, I have eaten chicken my whole life. I, this is the first time I, I tasted the real chicken. You know, especially the, the, the older folks who who had remember, good chicken yeah. in their childhood and remember that. And now they're like, wow, this is like chicken used to taste like. Now, those are the responses that we are tracking because... Once you have that, then the story spreads. Then they, they talk to the neighbor. Then they talk to the shopper next. Then they they do all kinds of things and it spreads. Uh, and that spread is what we are tracking and capitalizing on. Now, the, the, the problem is that it's, so is the industry. They're so looking at those trends, trends and those changes and then going out there and and calling whatever they have regenerative so that they can put it into those shelves and and fool the, the consumer the good thing is that once people have tasted the the quality of chicken that comes from an actual regenerative system it's so different that i think there is a point of differentiation and we're going to keep fighting for that because you know it it does you you asked about barriers i mean those are some of the most critical barriers we cannot produce cheap food nobody can it's just that we have this illusion that you can the challenge is that you know in the you know and, and will harris also talked about this and many other farmers talk about the risk associated with what we're doing but it's only perceived because conventional systems are actually more risky you know, they, they, they present the real risk, but how do we deal with that risk? What we load it onto taxpayers. Right now, as taxpayers, all we collectively pay for the risk of conventional systems. Now, regenerative systems are less risky, but we have to pay for that risk ourselves because there is no systems in place to, to socialize the cost and pocket the profits, which is what we do in conventional system. We socialize the high cost and risk and we pocket the profits. Well, in regenerative, there is, there, we pay the real cost and we pay for the risk. And because of that, the only thing we have is more wealth, not necessarily more profits. And so that wealth and that wealth management and distribution is actually the key antidote because we're talking about barriers Got to remember, we are, uh, we focus and concentrate. We are specialized in strategies to overcome those barriers. That's what my life has been about, and that's why we are in this business because we believe we can overcome those barriers, come out, you know, successful on the other side, and expand this space we're talking about that is changing and feeding it with the real stuff. And hopefully, as we do that, the culture, our biggest barrier, will start shifting. And then tip over, you know, at least for the next three or four generations before people forget all about it again and, and realize that our fields are so rich that they can be extracted upon really quick, which, you know, I know it's a pessimistic thing to say, but that's what we have done. We go one way all the way and then we come back all the way as societies over the history of forth. humanity. Yeah. Exactly. I just hope that we learn this time and that, you know, you know, this, this, uh, sixth, um, food system or, ex or potential extinction level uh, of destruction we're watching that it teaches us something and that we don't swing as much going forward and that we don't swing away from regenerative as we accomplish what we are here to do. And so it might be a good moment to to look at what tree range is now because you didn't stop at a, an acre and a half. Uh, definitely, you started to build a company around that and basically said, okay, how do we use this as, as a tool in, in many cases to, to spread wealth, to create more equality, to create an access point for people without, um, without any wealth or without any uh, large uh, acreage, let's say, to get into the regenerative agriculture and food space. So uh, how, did, how does it look? If somebody asks you now in, in, at a dinner party, let's say, in a few sentences, what is Tree Range Farms? How do you, how do you answer and how do you describe it? We're talking the end of 2023, just for, for a record, depending on when you listen to this, it might have shifted, changed, grew a lot, uh, et cetera, but we're, we're talking the end of 2023. Yes. So in this last year, we have been able to structure the company for for future growth, basically building all the all the foundational infrastructure any business needs. The difference is we have built that infrastructure and this business to aggregate, to brand, 
market, and distribute the output of an ecosystem of businesses rather than as a single standalone chicken business. And that is the biggest difference, right? So so even though our role is concentrated, our role is is the aggregation, the the the, the contracting, branding, marketing, aggregation, distribution of the outputs of the system with chicken at the forefront because that's the first output that the system delivers. But then remember, there is hazelnuts that are already coming through. There is vegetables, specialized vegetables that are coming out of the fields with the poultry manure is used. And we don't let it go. We, we capture everything because that is where the wealth creation and return on investment is centered on. It's not on the chicken. Um, the chicken is how we make the business case. Now, the other part of it is that as we built the eco, the business ecosystem, we also have a, a nonprofit organization. That nonprofit provides all the services to the farmers and the, um, the, including training, access to capital, negotiating with foundations for investments on the grassroots, organizing governance and all of that. Plus the nonprofit also owns the poultry processing facility, which is where a lot of the labor abuses happens in the conventional system. We chose not to put that into a private entity. Rather, we use the nonprofit so that the workers can run the operations and set the working standards and so on. So as we stand at so the just, end of 2023. Just to on, on that, like that's such a fundamental, fundamentally different way of organizing. Your processing, start with the chickens. And of course, there will be other processing of other um, products coming out of the system is owned by a nonprofit, is run by a nonprofit to avoid all the abuses that has been part of the, uh, let's say, for-profit chicken processing. If anybody has not visited one of those facilities, uh, I would urge you to do that, not because it's good or nice or interesting, I mean, but it's just a, a hard lesson of what humanity is capable of doing. Um, it will probably um, cure you of ever buying a, a, pro, a CAFO chicken or a factory chicken ever again, but you chose deliberately to do that in a different way and to put it in a nonprofit. Do you remember how that came about or what, like when was that moment to decide, okay, it's going to be in the for-profit or it's going to be in the nonprofit? Yeah, it, it was always in the nonprofit side. In fact, the company was originally supposed to be a, a subsidiary of the nonprofit, independent, but a subsidiary because, I mean, we're not naive. We knew that every business around us was, 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 was not making it. And so to, to, to go into that space for profit as a starting point didn't seem like a good idea to begin with, but there was an opportunity to do a hybrid and technically three inch farms. It's a hybrid by default, even though we are a for-profit company and we're taking investments and all of that, and it is structured to, to quantify and to hold that integrity. We have the other half of the ecosystem or more than half of the ecosystem is under the nonprofit structure intentionally. And so the intention was to achieve the triple bottom line without having the external pressures to to negotiate downwards, especially on labor and working conditions for people. I mean, here, listen, we have we have achieved the, you know, arguably the highest animal welfare because we are not defining whether these chickens are happy or not. They are simply in their best environment that the, the world could offer them. And if that is not the highest animal welfare, then there isn't such a thing, right? One. And two, why would, would, would we do that and then turn around and be part of exploiting immigrant families in the United States, which provide almost 100% of the labor that the conventional food system uses to create the illusion that there is such a thing as cheap food? Why would we do that to chickens and do the opposite to people and children? That is the big question. We can't not be part of something like that. It's simply not regenerative if you don't include the whole system, not just the practices on the land. And so it under our nonprofit structure, it has community-based, grassroots, governance, and ownership. And that changes the conditions. Now, it may still not do everything perfect, but it is miles, light years ahead of the game in terms of building the conditions for a regenerative food system in the future. So that was never under question. The question is, which parts can be done 
under a for-profit, completely independent, um, which parts can be done under a hybrid structure and which ones have to be 100% non-profit. And in this case, is is hybrid. But at the end, also, the, the governing system that we are installing for the whole regenerative poultry ecosystem under which re- regeneration, I mean, tree range farms will be part of, uh, the regenerative poultry council, that would be the maximum authority. And that authority will be represented will be made out of representatives from all of the different affinity group sectors, enterprise sectors in the system. And tree range farms will participate, will have a seat in that space, but it wouldn't be the decider. So that the farmers also have a seat. The grain growers, the poultry growers, the the poultry processing facility workers, the nonprofit partners, everybody sits in that council and then we collectively decide on 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 how the wealth is created whether we launch a new for-profit where we invite somebody from the outside versus growing the for-profit from within the ecosystem all of those decisions now become part of this truly regenerative framework that's where it all settles that's where we actually decide are we regenerating for real or are we just calling what we do regenerate for the sake of improving our brand presence or or facelifting our company? That's when the real the, the the rubber hits the road. So far, we are seeing very little of that anywhere else. And and so just to go back because I interrupted you um, on where we stand or where you stand at the end of of twenty twenty three. Um, you mentioned processing, then we went down uh, a tiny bit into that rabbit hole. But where where do you stand? You spent most of this year building the foundations, and then I interrupted you. So please take it from there. Right. So at this point, Tree Range Farms is in the middle of the seed stage race. Uh, one year into the startup stage, we have built sufficient markets for the current production, focused on the Twin Cities metro area, the Twin Cities in Minnesota, Minneapolis, and St. Paul, and then the surrounding markets. Uh, we started building the national partnerships to, to take our poultry into new uh, markets while we build new regions. We completed the processes with the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance for the training of uh, the systemic training of new farmers, including the, uh, you know, perfecting the online platform and they and built the main demonstration and training farm, which is my farm, uh, at least up to like 60% of its total capacity. So it's now operational. And we have, again, built all the structures so that we can hit 2024 with a solid network of farmers producing chicken, suppliers of all of the raw materials in place and vetted markets that are now built that now start the we start the year with those markets already established rather than having to build them throughout the year and then from there we can expand as the financing capacity the cash flows and all of those other very very straightforward business uh, business challenges are going to allow us to do so that's what we are right now we feel very strong we've we've we don't feel very we, we are not overconfident, but we are very, we are self-assured because we have built a team that is top-notch. Three of us right now are running, are running the company. And when we talk to people, everybody thinks we are like six or 10 people, right? Uh, the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance is, is now in, in tree range farms. We're coordinating day in and day out to ensure that as we grow the company, so does the farm supply system, and that is done resiliently so that so that we are not going to be whacked by the market swings and a lot of those other challenges we know we're going to fig- uh, face. We are trying to anticipate at this point a lot more of those challenges so that we can prepare for them. This year, we also completed our baseline life cycle assessment for the chicken, we completed our our first ESG. By the way, we scored on a investor grade ESG score. We doubled the industry average, so we are positioned to lead in the ESG space as well. And that gives us an opportunity to potentially position the company to enter new conversations with different kinds of investors into the as we move into the Series A race uh, after we're done with this uh, seed stage, and also. Um, completed a few partnerships that that brought in the capital 
to continue their research and development so that we can actually improve on the further on the production side. I mean, I touched on some of the innovations we have implemented. We are not even 50% done. We have a lot of new innovations that we're bringing into the poultry uh, production model. I'm not going to disclose them right now, but happy to talk about it as we implement them in the in the coming year. So that's what we are right now. It's very exciting. Um, again, we're not overconfident because we got a lot of challenges ahead of us, but we are very excited, energized, very self-assured and confident in the context that we have what it takes to at least give it our best. And if the market responds, investors respond, and our our uh, partnerships um, hold, 2024 is going to be a very exciting year for us. And let's say we're talking the end of next year. So we're talking the end of 2024. Uh, what is a good metric or a good, what would look success look like? Is it the amount of chickens, the amount of acres, the amount of new farmers or something completely different amount of vegetables? Like what would be something you look at and say, like, wow, that, that, that is a successful, um, that I would call, and in this case, you would call a successful year if we talk December, 2024 in 12 months or so. Yeah. First, uh, first indicator of success, we we'll still be in business. <laughs> Okay. We can still talk, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Well, I mean, talk is cheap, right? And but and we're doing our best. I mean, we we I have no doubt we will be in business, but that will be the best indicator of success. Second, we will we will have at least a you know set up the foundation to double the throughput of the company, meaning pounds of chicken going through the system. That means. Doubling, Just to give us an idea, like uh, how how much are we talking about um, now, and and what would doubling look like? So, so and, and let's differentiate capacity versus actual, right? So, in a year, you achieve a certain amount. So, we we didn't sell as many products this year, but we now have secured enough markets for one and a half million, roughly of sales just in the Twin Cities. Well, with the same in 2024, we'll have produced around 70,000. chickens, right? Yeah. Or pounds. Yes. Yeah, so okay. around 70,000 chickens um, that we would have produced and have and we'll have established the capacity to move into 2025 with capacity to around 250,000 chickens. That those are the metrics we're going to be held up against. And by the end of 2024, we need to have achieved one and a half million dollars of sales, at least to reflect on, on this year's efforts and whatever we do in 2024 and have built markets so that we can, we can secure to 2025 into the next million dollars. And then after that, um, we have been, uh, in fact, we're in the middle right now, about to finish in a couple of weeks, a high-level consultation with Kearney. I don't know if you know this global consulting firm. is one of the leading. I, I happen to have an Ashoka, <clears throat> an Ashoka Fellowship, as you know. And that Ashoka Fellowship brought us this... Um, this uh, services from Kearney International pro bono for to plan the, the company's next five years, at least the next three years with projections for two more years. And within that, we'll be finishing answering the questions for 2026, 27, uh, in, you know, and fine tuning those projections. But by, you know, as we go forward, our, our first benchmark is 2 million pounds of chicken, roughly 500,000 chickens being produced, processed, and marketed through the company. That's our next benchmark. And then from there, we'll go to 1 million to 2 million to 5 million and to 10 million, which is one regional blueprint. And at that point, we'll be at around 250 farms. Right now, we are at 11 farms. At the end of next year, we should be at around 25 farms with more farmers in training to go into 2025 and so on. I mean, this is the, the, the this is the, these are the stepping stones going forward here. And you, you are a listener of the podcast, so you know I like to ask uh, these these questions. What is um, and we've we've actually quite a few years ago, so we weren't on stage together, but at RFSI, at the Region Food and uh, Food Systems Investment uh, Forum, um, we met there. Let let's say we're on stage at the next one, maybe in Brussels, maybe in uh, in Denver, and we have a room full of investors. What do you 
without giving investment advice, obviously, but what would you like them to remember from our talk? Of course, they're going to be super interested in chicken. They, they might see pro protein slightly different. They are not only going to uh, look into, into grass fat and grass finished beef, but they actually say, wow, chickens is, is uh, a super interesting product. But let's, let's park that. They are excited. But what would be the main message you would like to, to be able to, for them to walk away with, to, to plant sort of a seed in their, in their mind? What would be, what would be your message to, to give to them? to see regenerative for what it actually is. If there is regenerative outcomes, then our system is regenerative. Whether you call it regenerative or not, is not relevant to its actual, you know, put, you know, potential regeneration, regen regenerative capacity. And here is what we offer, or what we want to talk about. When you look at a system that is designed as ours, you are de-risking the business side to the greatest extent that is possible by utilizing natural systems. One, you de-risk the main business, in this case, chicken. So you invest in the chicken knowing that you're investing in an ecosystem. The ecosystem is what makes the return on investment possible, not because you are extracting on the farmers that produce the chicken or the company, but because you are capturing the wealth of an ecosystem. And that wealth is much greater than the money that we put in at the beginning. That only materializes when true regenerative principles are applied. And that's what we are inviting you to do. Now, right now, of course, we are launching a, a poultry center business. But just as we speak right now, we have garlic production that is starting to increase exponentially because of the poultry manure coming out. Now, that garlic is being produced with almost no inputs. I mean, the cost of the input is the cost of feed for the chickens. To give you an idea, to plant a, an acre of garlic, you need around $20,000 worth of seed and around six to $7,000 worth of fertilizer to make it actually come out, you know, healthy. What we don't have either because we built a seed bank that we are now spreading to the farmers. Um, as part of an internal system, and the poultry manure covers 100% of the piece. inputs. That is what I want to point you to. Enter really into this space shift. with us. Yes, it's a mindset shift. And then let's together capture the wealth of this ecosystem and then later distribute it. I don't call it return on investment. I call it wealth management systems where all of us participate on deciding how that wealth is then managed. And yes, you can call your part return on investment if you want to, but now you will be part of one, changing the world, you know, not losing your money, in fact, making some if that's what is important to you, but also becoming part of the solution and stop being part of the problem. So it's, it's doable. It's so tangible. We have demonstrated we can do it. We just need the partnerships now to be able to move it to the next stage. And so take us to, because we've talked before as well, and, and I think you shared some of your um, struggles or, or interesting conversations, let's say, with the financial world. How has this message landed in general? I mean, until now, um, how much of the financial, even the impact world has, has still an extractive mindset compared to an indigenous regenerative who focused on, on wealth, not necessarily return on investment? Like how has been um, fundraising going um, and, and how much of on an educational journey, let's say you've been instead of, um, uh, fr how, how frustrating has it been? Sorry, let's get to the chase. How frustrating has it been so far? Um, well, when you operate from from the perspective I do, frustration isn't something you can afford. You simply share. You share with the most abundance that you can find in within, within. You work hard. And then those who come along and partner with you, you give thanks for them. Uh, you ask for the energy of the universe to flow through the them so <laughs> others will listen. And as we do that, Every day, we are encountering the people who are making these investments and moving in this direction. And I don't think of the ones that haven't as, as lost causes. I believe that every time we have an opportunity to have even the slightest conversation, a seed is planted, it will eventually grow into something. Now, that's, that's the work we do. It's the regenerative finance 
Um, I work in regenerative finance, not because necessarily I'm taking my own personal capital, although I did some of that for Tree Range Farms, um, but because we are all part of building a system that regenerates the mindset you know, and turns the mindset and shifts the paradigms so that we can achieve what we want. When we do that, things will change. For we, for when you wake up in the morning with that intention and you dedicate the energy of your day to that outcome and move that energy, it does have a mathematical certainty that it will happen. That's the world I live in. And and that's why there is no space for pessimism or frustration or anything. Now, it doesn't mean that we are succeeding yet, so we still got to do a lot more work. I just see it as a, as a challenge to be tackled, as an opportunity to grow in my own world as we help others grow on their own. And you already mentioned something on culture before, but it might not be the answer to, to this question, which is the, the magic wand question. If you could change one thing overnight, what would it be? Uh, yeah, I, for starters, I don't wish anyone uh, um, to die or anything like that, okay? <laughs> but we need to kill the colonizer, meaning the spirit of colonizer within us. If we could just balance it out with the indigenous intellect and an indigenous capacity we have, if we could at least balance those two, we would see the other 95% of opportunities out there that we squander when we focus on extraction and exploitation and destruction. A magic wand to change that on every person on the planet will flip tomorrow the way we see and interact with the living systems of the planet in a couple of years from now, we would have healed the earth and be happy again. If I had a magic wand, that's what I would put it. I wouldn't put it in, like I know people would probably, I, I heard people say, well, I, I wish for $3 million. It's like no money in this planet is gonna change anything if our inside, who we are, doesn't change. And that is fundamentally the problem we have, is who we are right now, who we have become as we evolve in this planet. It's no longer, it's, it's more now equivalent to the behavior of viruses than to the behavior of a rational thinking, sophisticated mind. And this is a rabbit hole, but how far, I mean, you grew up in a very different context than um, let's say in a city center or in a financial center or in a big city, et cetera. Like how difficult do you see or have you seen that, let's say for people that are not from indigenous, I mean, we're all from indigenous backgrounds, but maybe it took a few more generations ago. Let's say just asking, asking for a friend, AKA myself, grew up in the city center of Rotterdam. Um, how do I flip that switch? Or how difficult is it? How far deep do I have to go? Um, if you're willing to in, in, engage just a bit of the indigenous intellect, they will tell you this. You and I and every living creature on this planet are indigenous to this planet. Nobody is not. We're made of the elements of the earth. We're primarily carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, like 97.5%. Like, okay, we're indigenous to the planet. The question is, do we understand what that means? when we go around and live our daily lives? That's the first question, and that's the first thing we gotta reconcile with. And then after that, let's look at, at what we yearn for. You may be from the city, but why are you here sitting talking about this? You may be from anywhere you want. We are fundamentally, when we start touching that indigenousness that we are born with, it starts to speak to us and it gets louder and louder and louder. And eventually, for people like you, if it literally forces you to make a shift in your life because you are no longer happy with the status quo. Now, that's the way we do this. Everyone out there, ask ask that, feel that, you know, go within and, and, and talk to your indigenous self you were born with. Bring that, you know, I call it the green man 
I grew up in the shadow of green men. That's the name of my book. And in the shadow of green men is intended to excite that internal force that we all carry with us and we suppress it in the name of the pursuit of happiness, which is coded in the pursuit of individualism, which results in mental illness, physical illness, and spiritual poverty. When we do that, those things become manageable and become solvable, including the climate crisis. That is how powerful we are as creatures, as living systems. And we just, we just got to tap into it and then make the changes that we need. And you will see it just like you did. Many others have. I, I have never had to change much because I was born, I, like I say, I was born naked and the rest of it is profit. So, <laughs> so there's no, I mean, for, but for a lot of folks who, again, you were pointing out, Live, you know, we're born outside of the so-called natural environment. I mean, there's no such a place on the planet. Everything is natural. But, but if you feel disconnected, you some of the emptiness is coming from the fact that you yearn to be connected again because you are primarily a creature of the planet, indigenous to this planet, and he wants to be. You want to be, and we die with that hold when we don't pursue it in our lifetime. You got an opportunity to do that, which is. Potentially a perfect end to this interview, but there are still a few more questions I would love to ask and get your perspective <laughs> on. It's a terrible bridge. I know listeners, I'm sorry. Um, but actually th th there's a good bridge here. We're both inspired, I think, relatively uh, quite often by, by John Kemp. And I like to ask a question he likes to ask as well in a slightly different form. What do you believe to be true about regenerative agricultures that others don't? The true regenerative concept is actually defined by a way of thinking, of learning, of being, of relating, a way of living. And those things are codified on how we relate, how we relate to each other and how we relate to all of the living systems of the planet. When we lose touch of those relationships, we lose touch of our reality and of our own identity as a living, as part of that living system. That is the foundation of regenerative. If we can't do that, we will start seeing that, you know, we, we start seeing this whitewashing we're watching uh, happening right now, where people are calling products regenerative or a farm regenerative when there is no such a thing. Only ecosystems have the capacity to regenerate because regenerative is about life. It's not about practices on the land or about a product. It's about life itself. And life itself thrives on building relationships. Where there is no relationships, we become we, we become brain dead, literally, and we suffer the consequences. So this is where, where we are being challenged right now. Can we, are we able to resist the colonization of this concept and embrace it for what it is, which is the restore, this restore, the restoration of the, or the regeneration of the relationships across the living systems so that we can again balance things out all the way from the carbon in the atmosphere to the emotional, you know, the daily emotions that we go through that results either in imbalance that we call mental illness and all kinds of other consequences of that disbalance, imbalance. And are we able to do that? Now, regeneration is about re regenerating all of those, cap all, of, all of our capacity to do that. And that's about relationships. When we do that, everything else starts to add up and start to connect again. Which is interesting because I think it's something John Kemp also likes to, to say it's about uh, restoring relationships. And this is a, a bit of a shift, but I still would love to hear your, your perspective. If um, you might put it all in, in, in chickens, but I'm still, still curious what you would do with a billion dollar investment fund. If you would be in charge, uh, let's say tomorrow morning, you wake up, it could be very long term, uh, could be, uh, but it has to be put to work and ideally uh, come back in some shape or form. But what would you do if you'd be in charge? Of, uh, of a lot of money, because even in today's world with inflation, et cetera, this is still uh, uh, a lot of money to, to be put to work. But I think we're going to see the interest from players as soon as more and more people and institutions wake up to the potential of, of regeneration and true regeneration, uh, we're going to see a lot of interest. So I, I would love to keep asking that question because we're, we're going to get those questions and already are getting those questions. So what would you do? Yeah. And, and, and I do want uh, a few billion dollars if you, if you can find them. 
And this is what I'll do. There's three stages of which capital can become regenerative. The first one is you find spaces that that need need to be um, fed again, brought back to health. And so if we're talking about focusing, and, and, and by the way, you can't throw enough money at this. this. The problem is quite big. So I will focus on a specific area, geographical, where the impact can be optimized within a concrete space so that so that we can see regenerative outcomes because you can't do that in a in a in a fragmented kind of concentrate investment. Yeah. Exactly. Concentrate, focus on restoring that region to health with those with that original money. Because what happens is once health is restored, this the ecosystem turns that capital, that natural capital over and over and over. You will have a guaranteed return on investment. Uh, if you focus the first investments on restoring the space to health, if you if you feel like, you know, and and, and you balance it out, of course, because because you need you need the, the 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 landscape health, and you need some basic infrastructure, but those become necessary, critical things that if they are not present at all. But you first try to bring in from another place, leverage, 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 and focus the, the new capital as much as possible to bring the space back to health so that its capacity to regenerate becomes the foundation of how that capital reproduces for many, many generations, seven generations. The rest of it is infrastructure. Others should put up the infrastructure. And if they want, okay, then take a little bit of that original capital and put it into infrastructure. But leverage. And the only way to leverage it permanently is to focus it on ecosystems health. The rest of it will happen because of it. So where would you start? Where would you focus it? You would focus on one region. If you had to pick one, of course, it's a very tricky and weird question, but what what would you do (laughs) if you were forced in that position? Let's say, what would you do? I mean, we already have a blueprint for regenerative poultry. Would it be and, the Midwest and we, poultry or would it be somewhere else or another? Like what what comes to mind first? Yeah, with that kind of money, we could deploy the southern region, which would allow us to balance out the fact that it's cold here in the winter. With the So it's cold here in the winter, but it's, it's cooler in the south. When it's warm here in this part of the world, it's too hot in the south. So this will balance out that. And then the East Coast, southern part of the East Coast, the Southeast region of the U.S. for the Eastern seaboard supply systems. And then Northern California, Northwest or the Northwest U.S. for the West part, because that's where the the water and the ecology is is more forgiving and um, literally easier to regenerate. And then we'll, we'll launch those four regions. And within those four regions, we'll create the code for launching a seven and a half plus potential billion dollar industry sector focused on poultry, regenerating the landscape, the water systems, the the grain supply system, which is directly affected by the poultry. We will have a ripple impact that it will be in excess. What I estimated way back, it was between five and 12 times what you put up front because of the way the, the, the system churns the capital. And five times is if we don't, aggregate all of the enterprise sectors, just the core. But the, the poultry system affects up to 12 enterprise sectors um, uh, per region, which can turn capital around to multiplying effects of up to 12 times. Actually, yeah, that's, that's a good point on, on the feed, which we haven't really um, talked about or double clicked on. Uh, what do you tell to people that say, but it's better to eat the, gra- the grains directly? Um, instead of, of uh, let's say, passing it through, which is not really the right term, but through through an animal. Like, what's your response to to the feed um, conversion ratio and and let's say the, oh, oh, partly the plant based or let's eat feed directly instead of feeding it to an animal uh, discussion? Well, you you interfere with the actual cycles of energy transformation. Uh, the feed conversion rate of a of a livestock is actually um um um. um a mind created concept. It's a colonizing concept. It's, it's the feed conversion rate was determined to whether we can extract value out of the chicken, not whether we are efficiently transforming energy. So when you look at energy transformation as the foundational function of an ecosystem rather than the production of output, then you get the most output 
and the most efficient energy conversion. When you have to look at conversion rates, you don't look at the livestock, you look at the ecosystem conversion rates and you always get more energy out than you put in. You will never get that if you if you harvest the energy too early for human consumption. You got to let it flow and you got to let it through its cycles. And then we can harvest the most energy output out of that transformation process. So if you are a colonizer, you look at the feed conversion rate and the return on investment short term. If you, if you are looking at it from an indigenous perspective, you look at the life cycles. And yes, but in order for that to be effective, you would have to eat the grain straight out of the field. Now, are you willing to do that? Oh, well, then awesome. And also poo, uh, you know, pee and poop right in the field too. Otherwise, let the animals do that part and focus on the next stage where the actual energy has been transformed for us to take in without, you know, think of it this way. The protein you take out of the chicken versus the food that you bring out of the already processed grain. Now, we can do that mechanically, physically, or put it through the animals and harvest the food ready to eat. Now, why would I not want the food ready to eat instead of picking up oats out of the field and chewing them up and, you know, cutting up my tongue and my lips? I mean, literally, that's what animals do for us. So the, the, we, we tend to get, you know, into these rabbit holes where, where we don't actually see things for what they are. And that's why I'm always saying the indigenous, engage the indigenous intellect and the innate intelligence and see the whole picture before we make statements about what is better and is not. And I think that's a perfect end to this conversation. I want to thank you so much, Reginaldo, for the work you do and for coming on here uh, to share. And of course, for listening to the podcast uh, every now and then. I greatly appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to check in and, and see, um, uh, first of all, very much um, hoping and, and very confident that the company will still be around whenever we check in, if that's in 12 months or beyond that. But you never know. So hoping that. And then... Um, checking in on the progress, checking in on what you've learned, um, what you've seen and how this, this ecosystem has been blossoming and, and regenerating. So thank you so much for coming here. And I don't think, and I hope it's not the last one. Well, thank you. And just the final clarification, I am not advocating that you eat meat. I'm advocating that we see the whole picture. And there is a lot of photosynthetic outputs that are designed for us, fruits, nuts, vegetables, and so on. And honestly, we don't even have to eat meat. It's just that we do. And if we're going to do that, let's do it responsibly. So thanks so much for you, for the time here, for the opportunity to bring the stats into this new audience. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.